Uh, we now have time for direct questions from the audience. So, gentlemen there. Uh, I have a couple of questions and clarification mostly, but I find very interesting. You're probably familiar with the recent research on, on, uh, link, or on Syria linking drought, urbanization, and the crisis that evolved there. And I would ask you to maybe comment on your findings in relation to that argument, which would suggest in your last point, you pointed out that people are reducing their, their uh, exposure to drought but it could be also that they are escaping drought, uh, which is the argument that has been put forward for explaining conflict in Syria. And as a result of escaping drought, they end up in urban centers and end up in open conflict with people that they, they normally wouldn't be exposed to. So I would hazard a guess, to use a maybe a badly phrased uh, word, the, the idea here being that there is both a cause and consequence and conflict is a mediating factor. You haven't really given us a model here um, to suggest that uh, perhaps the movement of peoples is partly explained by ultimately your hazard risks, which are drought and flood, and conflict is the result of that. Whereas you've portrayed it more or less as an independent cause, and I would suggest that it's a, it is impacted by those other more structural factors that are sometimes beyond the control of uh, leaders or individuals, sometimes not. For example, drought can be politically uh, designed, whereas uh, flooding may not be. The other basic question I had is regard to your flooding. Why you chose to operationalize it in such a kind of an interesting way, 100-year floods, why not look at trend lines over a short period of time, or did you just not get enough variance on that? Because it strikes me that you're just not going to get the same kind of trend line if you're looking at that 100-year one, average for risk exposure for flooding instead of looking at the incidences of floods on an annual basis. Um, maybe, it, as you point out, there just wasn't enough uh, trend for you to draw some conclusions on, uh, from. But nevertheless, I mean, uh, everything else you've told us in terms of operationalizing your risk factors are based on trend lines, and, that, and all of a sudden you throw at us a one-year or 100-year average for floods, or maybe I've misunderstood that. Uh, your comment about uh, uh, conflict being the consequence of drought or floods and people moving out of, of the countryside into cities, I definitely agree. Um, I've seen a lot of studies uh, on, on the effect of drought on the incidence of conflict and also on urbanization and, and conflict. There's a, there's a big... Uh, correlation there. This paper should be seen just from the perspective of an individual. If you're born somewhere and everything is out of your control, what are the, the risk factors that you're exposed to on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis? Um, so yeah, so that was more of a comment to that. In terms of the flood data that I'm talking about, um, I don't know, this is, uh, this is a hazard map that has been developed by the UN and it's um, it takes into account different things. It takes into account sort of, you know, discharge models for, for rivers and to see where, which areas would be affected if, they, if there's too much water in the, in the rivers. But it also takes into account this database on floods that has actually taken place, observed floods in this period uh, from the Dart, Dartmouth Flood Observatory. And, um, and for this, they just, I guess what you should see each uh, of those pixels or the colors on the pixels as is the risk that there will be a flood next year, basically. Um, yeah. So I hope this answers the question. That's a constant, it's not yeah, yeah, that's a constant. Yeah, uh, so again, for some of the risk factors, we have this constant hazard map that we are, we are then uh, looking at population movements in, in relation to, and for others, we look at how they change over time. So doesn't that suggest, sorry, I just want to get a response here, because a lot of this seems to be driven by population growth. Yep. Uh, just more people being exposed to hazards. Uh, yep. Unless you can say something about the trend line regarding the in increasing in incidences of hazards, I would say that just more people are being exposed because there's more people in Africa. I mean, how would yep. you rebut that? No, I don't want to do that. I think you're absolutely right that the, the reason why we see an, a, such a large increase in the number of people being exposed to these hazards uh, is because of population growth, obviously. But uh, if you look at the, uh, the shares, how the shares change over time, we see that 
the, the share of population exposed to drought is not increasing so much, whereas the, the share of people exposed to flood is increasing a lot. And this, I conclude, is because people are moving into cities closer to, to rivers where they are exposed to flood risk, away from, from the rural areas where there's a large risk of drought. Okay, then. Have, have you compared your results to actual data on mortality or people who have suffered from these hazards during these same years? Um, for the, well, uh, for the drought data, which was something that we developed uh, more or less ourselves, or at least calculated the index ourselves, uh, what I've done is I've, uh, I've checked this up against other data sources. The problem is that we need data sources that cover the whole continent and that are um, that measured in a consistent way across countries, right? So it's very hard to find something that you can actually validate the data on. But what we did is we correlated this with um, the state index that we constructed ourselves with self-reported droughts at the district level, so at the subnational level. Uh, every time somebody has reported drought to an international database, uh, we found that at least using our data, we could get a, a, a lot higher uh, R-square or explanatory power than if we used some different alternative measures that that were based on weather stations and sort of compiled from different sources. Flood mortality and malaria mortality, have they, they been going up or down? Um, I have no idea, actually. Sorry. Yes, is there, is there a, a source that I could go to to sort of uh, look up disasters, who defines the disasters and, um, and find the data on disasters? Because it seems to be a rather abstract quantity. Um, the other thing is about using river floods. Um, the floods I've been experiencing myself are, are floods in urban areas because there's a sudden, sudden heavy rainfall and sewers back up and, and the water becomes contaminated and things like that, not directly related to rivers. So are you... Uh, they've got a way of looking at this type of flooding. For, firstly, for the question about the sources for these type of data, if you're interested in, in disasters as, as such, which is you know, events that combine the hazard with the exposure and the vulnerability, then there is this EM that EM that which is hosted by a university in Belgium uh, that contains uh, information about most uh, large disaster events in the world. But this is something, as I showed in the first slide, uh, that I'm a little bit critical towards because uh, there tends to be more complete reporting over time in this database. Uh, so what I'd suggest is try to find uh, data on the hazards and then, um, then, I mean, depends on what kind of analysis you want to make, basically. But if in economic analysis, I think it would be better to use hazard data uh, in itself. And uh, there are a lot of sources on, for instance, if you look at drought, then the sources of rainfall data. If you look at floods, then I can, I think I can recommend this river and flood database, although it's not, it's not fantastic. And this leads me to back to your next, your next question. Uh, so I guess what we suffer from here is we try to do, say something general about uh, the whole continent and we need some very large databases to do this and we need them to be measured in a consistent way across countries. So this leaves out a lot of detail and I would, the, probably the figure that I'm most worried about here is the flood figure because as you also say, it doesn't take into account this, uh, these kind of floods that are caused by, uh, by rainfall. So I would say probably a lot more people are exposed to flood than, than what you see here, but it's the in interesting thing is perhaps more the trend that more people are being exposed to this particular type of flood all the time. Okay, another question here. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I just have a quick one. Uh, your table four, you looked at the correlation between uh, living in an urban environment and exposure to hazards, yeah. and you reported some correlation coefficients. I'm just wondering whether you, you had any test of, uh, uh, statistical test of significance 
because you seem to draw conclusions based on uh, the science yeah. that you obtain, but some of the figures may not actually be statistically significant. So I'm just wondering whether you, you tested that or not. Thank you. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, so this, this table only shows this correlation coefficients. This is a simple correlation matrix. Uh, but as you might imagine, since we have 29 million uh, observations in this database, all of them are highly significant. But I'm not sure I would... Uh, that's why I, I don't think it's so meaningful to report this. Simply because of the number of, of observations, even a tiny signal will, will shine through. And we should probably be more, uh, think more about how each of the elements are measured instead of looking at the significance level. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the presentation. Um, I think probably, as I'm called Medina from Uganda, uh, given that I work for a policy think tank, I would like to see more policy messages coming out of this mm. information other than being a bit on our academic side. But I think for more informativeness for this work would be if you pick out some bit of like job maps for case studies within the sub-Saharan component, given that the risk management aspects within these economies actually driving some of the, the results you're getting. You find that the risk management aspects within South Africa is different from Uganda, which are just basically maybe on paper. And uh, you find or camouflage some of the information you're getting in terms of either not being affected by malaria in urban areas. But you find that because South Africa has better risk management, for these hazards, probably that's why in, in urban areas you're getting better results. And the integrated urban planning maps, which actually help in managing risk, uh, can kind of uh, derail or foster some of the results you're getting. So if you pick out within your analysis a couple of country geo maps, which can actually show you that differences within Heterogeneity within these economies is critical to risk management. Yes. Okay, thank you for your comment. Um, in terms of risk management and, and of course, policy conclusions, I, uh, there's a little bit of a difference between which uh, of these hazards we look at, uh, what conclusions you can draw. Um, you're absolutely right in terms of the risk of, of uh, malaria, of being exposed to malaria. There's a huge difference between countries and areas, depending on what kind of interventions have been made. In fact, those who, who wrote this paper on the malaria data, they uh, guessed that, that a, a large share of this reduction in malaria has been uh, taken place because of uh, interventions such as insecticide-treated nets that have been dealt out in some places, but of course not in all places. So this, uh, in this case, uh, the risk of, of exposure to malaria is somehow confounded what, with what I <laughs> warned against in the first slide, that, you, that uh, you also look at vulnerability when you're actually saying you're looking at a hazard. So I'm, I'm also susceptible to this uh, error myself. Um, whereas the risk of, of floods and, and uh, drought in this study should be uh, unaffected by policy decisions or risk management in this study. Whereas in reality, if you go to the ground, there will be a big difference between the, the risk of floods in a well-developed place that, that have strategies for where to build buildings and in a place where there are no strategies for how to on, and where to build. So this is something that is not taken into account in that case, whereas it is taken into account in, in the malaria case, which might in turn confound the results a little bit. So, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move forward. Okay, give the floor to Henrik Hansen. Questions? Chris Kyle, a local participant from Finland. Have the results of your an analysis actually been used by the Vietnamese government to any extent? Uh, no, it has not. <laughs> no, and that's partly because they probably don't know it because it's 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 uh, an academic paper uh, that we've been writing, and academic papers are have to be accepted, and it's still unpublished. Um, 
the, uh, it was the, it, my co-author and I have both been working for a, a government uh, organization in Vietnam, uh, so so they know of these results and it it, it, it may be used in, in ways we don't know, because but they do know about it. A uh, very interesting study, but I, I would be curious to know how this stacks up against states that are more vulnerable. Uh, Vietnam, arguably, is a fairly resilient country, so uh, you're kind of uh, preaching to the converted, if you will, a country that has shown its ability to recover from war, for example, rather quickly and co chart its own course. Well, what are the implications for countries that are not coping as well, the, the more fragile states, this, a small island developing states in particular that are highly vulnerable to a variety of effects induced by climate change, including hurricanes and so on. To give you an example, Haiti was brought up earlier as a country that didn't uh, cope well in the face of an earthquake, but in addition also a number of hurricanes have hit that country. And they go about constructing buildings in a way that are resilient to earthquakes, but not necessarily hurricanes and vice versa. You didn't tell us about you know, the construction methods that were pursued after the hur hurricane in Vietnam in particular, whether they altered their course or trajectory. Maybe you did, um, uh, but it, you know, did they pursue a different kind of uh, building construction that would provide lessons for countries, or more particular, inform the insurance uh, sector as to what is the sort of investments that they need to make and who they would work with in the, in the construction industry uh, to ensure that another hurricane, which will inevitably come, uh, will not uh, generate the same kind of impact. You also didn't tell us about fatalities. Um, were there any deaths from this and how much? Thank you very much. Um, yes, there were, there were several questions. Yes, there were fatalities, uh, not that many. I think it's 10, uh, eight or 10 fatalities. And yes, Vietnam is prepared and, and they react. Uh, and as I said, the reason why Danbury was something special is because uh, it changed course fairly late. So, so while we were following the trajectory from, from the Japanese Meteorological Institute uh, hitting, uh, actually as you, you see, uh, we were all expecting it to, to, to slow down considerably because, because this island is taking a lot of it, right? And then uh, it followed. We were, we were thinking that it would go slightly more south and be uh, less uh, severe. So that was a, that was the surprise part, and the reason why, uh, because uh, there was evacuation going on right uh, when it happened, but just the wrong place uh, at the time, right? Uh, the, the 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 Vietnamese army move out quickly when they have this trajectory to evacuate people if it's serious, and that of course is what you're saying. The uh, the reason why we can do it here is because uh, hurricanes or big storms uh, are not that rare in Vietnam. So they know what to do. And also we know uh, that we have data and they, they're coping with it. The earthquake in Haiti uh, is in my view not uh, a very good uh, um, case for statistical analysis. <laughs> right? What we're doing here is that we try to establish uh, statistical measures and that means that we have to have something where we can use laws of large, not large numbers in some sense. right? And when you have the very, very rare event or the truly outlying event, this method is not useful. So it can be used, uh, I would say also in small island states, where it's not also not rare to have these hurricanes. And we know that they're coping with it, right? So, so in, and we also have household surveys or other kinds of data that are comparable over time, then it's useful. But for the big event, I don't believe in statistics at all, uh, even though I do it. Uh, I mean, for the big, truly big events, we have to go there. Uh, and we have to be on the ground and we, we have to look at it as an independent case or event and take it from there. Um, here, because there is some form of repetition, which is not completely random, but uh, you know, we can randomize in some sense, we can, we can assess the impact and it may be useful for the future. And it may be useful for, for Vietnam to, to look at, at the costs. Uh, and I think that's where we can use it. We cannot use it in all cases for flooding events also in sub-Saharan Africa. And if for states without data, weak states without household service, of course, it's not useful at all. So yes, I'm preaching to the... <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are some more questions back, back there. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Henrik. Two quick questions. 
Did you have any data on savings and what happened to savings, um, you know, post um, uh, hurricane or typhoon? And then secondly, I was a little surprised that there wasn't an increase in food purchases um, following the event. And you said that it could have been due to a substitution effect. But um, I just wanted to kind of push you there a bit because, you know, we know that um, food markets worked pretty well in Vietnam, so presumably it wasn't a, a supply effect. So was it just a question of lack of ability to, uh, to purchase? You're pushing me into speculation, uh, but that's fine. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, since it's based on the uh, household surveys, we could actually look into savings. Uh, we do not because we, we haven't uh, constructed, as you see, we, we, uh, we have a very specific measure of income and, and, uh, and, and, and we could, of course, look at, at the savings component also from the household surveys. But we didn't do that. But that is probably a good idea to do, uh, in addition to the loans, of course. Uh, second, no, I'm, I'm also convinced it's not a supply effect uh, being so close uh, to the Red River Delta. Um, so, so my guess is it's, it's, it's actually that they were, some of them were poor. Uh, but that's pure speculation. I don't know why they did not increase uh, by, uh, the, the, you know, buying food. Thanks. Actually, mine was uh, quite related to his previous comment uh, because I was trying to compare the results you just reported. And uh, one of the results you show um, a decline in yield, although not statistically significant. And uh, on the other result, you say that there was uh, an increase on uh, self-produced uh, food consumption. On the other hand, you say there is n zero uh, effect on the income, uh, both sideline income and total income, and uh, you say that there was also a decline uh, in the uh, uh, purchased food consumption. And I was a little bit keen about the mechanism behind this uh, kind of uh, contradicting effect, and I was thinking maybe saving could be playing a role, something related to that. So I was uh, actually about to follow up on that question, did you look into this kind of other potential uh, driving mechanism to this contradictory kind of effect? Um, we, we haven't looked into these different mechanisms, if, if you want. Uh, you, you can certainly have uh, a, a decrease in paddy production and an increase in, in self-consumption, right? Because uh, you need not, I mean, they, they consume other things than, than rice as such. So what we think of is here that they actually consume their dead livestock, right? If, if, uh, if the, the chicken were died during uh, because of the storm or mudslide or uh, you know the flood that the rain that comes after this is what we see as, as increased consumption as such uh it's it's true to the they they sell most of the rice uh the self-consumption of, of rice in this area is not that big uh, as such right so so that would that would affect their income more than they will and then consumption via the income effects that's true. Uh, also, unfortunately, we don't have the prices. But again, based on the markets in Vietnam, uh, there are not that big uh, price effects in this area uh, on, on paddy because it comes from, from elsewhere. But it's, it's true. Uh, we should. We, we were also surprised there is no significant loss, right? We were looking into, looking into whether or not they would increase uh, labor supply and sideline income given this loss in their e income from, from paddy. But that's not what we saw. Okay, another question here. Thank you, I'm among the converted anyway. So, uh, because one of the issues I read about Vietnam is the, um, the way they use their army to, to mitigate these issues. The, the government really responds by use of the army into agriculture related issues, into disaster management. And probably that's why you find the aspect on disaster aid not really going to the Vietnamese themselves, but the budget which is going to control the disaster management, largely goes to the army to make sure they come in to actually manage disasters. So probably on the aspect of the cost benefit analysis, we do that. If you give us that nice story of how government comes in to kind of mitigate these impacts, that way the households actually do not really feel the, the aspect of employing more people to control some of these disaster management aspects. So the story really is good at, at that level for how maybe other governments we can use our armies to come into control the aspects on disaster and quantifying the natural risks. 
Thank you. Uh, the, the use of, of the army and military in disaster situations is something that we discuss with, with uh, sociologists and anthropologists. Uh, they do not agree with us that it's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> I mean, turning, turning a disaster into a, a military situation is not always good. But yes, it's true. In Vietnam, they're using the army for a lot of this. The aid component that we're looking for is that they have a special fund uh, for transfer, transfer of money. So it's a social transfer that could be used, which is always also for starvation and pre-harvest uh, or pre-harvest starvation. So this is a very particular question in the survey questionnaire that we looked for, right? Uh, we have not, if, if you notice, when we say cost-benefit analysis, it's, it's truly only at the household level, right? We have no cost uh, for the government uh, as such. Uh, we, we try to compare what happens to households. Uh, in private households. So, so uh, this larger picture is uh, not ready yet. Right? We had to add a lot to that on, in terms of expenditures. All right, let's take one more. My name is Pekka Reynik and I'm from the Finnish Red Cross. So we're an organization dealing with the aftermath of different kinds of disasters. Um, layman's sort of interpretation of what you said is probably that, that it pays off to prepare. Um, I mean, one of the most interesting things to, to, to get out of the studies like your, yours is actually whether um, uh, preparedness, when you invest in preparing communities for events like this, actually pays off to the extent that that investment into preparedness would be the wisest thing to do on Earth when it comes to especially areas where you have frequent events like these? As, as a layman, I agree with you. Um, uh, interpreting, I, I, don't, I think it would be pushing the results of this paper uh, because we, we actually, we, 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 we do not compare with and without preparation, right? So it will be pushing the results of our paper quite a lot. If you, if you want to, you can maybe you can say something like Vietnam, since Vietnam has experienced these storms a lot, farmers are used to it. They have this spread out of plots uh, and, and they know what to do. Also, they also know to move away in time if possible. So that saves lives uh, and, and possibly livelihood. I don't know, but it does not come out of our study. But, but yes, I agree in, in general terms that preparation is best, right? but I think Morton will talk much more about that. No, Morton may mention that in a second. <laughs> okay, anyway, good time to give the floor to, to Morton. <laughs> so, comments, please. Thank you very much for the presentation. I mean, I have... Um, I work for the Africa Progress Panel, which is an, a think tank based in Geneva, and is chaired by Kofi Annan. And last year, we did a report, basically um, uh, trying to figure out what would be the position of Africa as they head out to COP21 in Paris. And the whole narrative, I mean, has changed. And now it's more about how do they mitigate? How do countries mitigate and adapt to I mean, increasing uh, climate impact? I mean, it's clear that the risk, I mean, have been accepted by all, but how do they now uh, reduce or mitigate this risk? And now it boils down to finance. And then I had the opportunity to talk to some climate negotiators ahead of COP21. And I mean, it was one of, I mean, the topmost, I mean, of their priority was that there should be finance. And the finance, I mean, interestingly, governments have committed to supporting themselves through the, uh, the INDCs, and which was accepted in COP21. But it's the issue of equity and fairness when it comes to climate finance. If you pollute more, you should pay more. And this is what the narrative should be about. I mean, I mean, I mean we run the risk of having, I mean, I would say, a fatigue when it comes to the whole climate discussion. If countries suffering or bearing the brunt of increasing uh, emissions from other countries. If they are not able to get the finance to help local farmers um, adapt to changing weather uh, patterns, then definitely the discussion will not, have, um, will not go further. So for me, it's about having I mean, this well-focused narrative about climate finance 
because there is one thing to promise and there is another thing to make sure that these promises are met. And the only promises that count are promises that are met. If they are not met, then those promises are definitely shouldn't even be made. So if you change, I mean, the whole narrative. And I also add one to, I mean, the whole uh, challenges climate change brings. I mean, apart from migration, public health and food production, there is another rising I mean, impact when it comes to energy. And now, I mean, most African countries, I mean, are having energy challenges because you have water, da uh, water levels in dams reducing. And now, I mean, without energy, then I mean, none, I mean, no economy can run, I mean, efficiently. So if you add energy to the whole discussion, that will also be um, quite um, I mean, important. And let me bring in one issue that cut across the whole presentation was the issue of, if you're talking about risk and we are trying to reduce the risk when it comes to I mean, uh, weather extremes, then it has to start, the whole discussion has to start from the fact that how do they, I mean, how do countries become more proactive than reactive? I mean, I'm talking about, uh, we have, if you go to some I mean, sub-Saharan African countries, maybe Ghana, for example, in, when there's a flood or when there's an I mean, impending flood, we have the meteor agencies having, not having the ability to predict even rainfalls. So when it comes to this, I mean, it has to do, yeah, they, are able, they should be able to predict these weather extremes. And then the next discussion will be, okay, this is, I mean, what is before us, and then we can find, I mean, a critical solution. So for me, it's about the weather data and how we can predict extreme weather uh, situations, and then how they own. I mean, now the issue is data ownership. Should the data be owned by governments or by the private sector? Or must it be a PPP? If that comes to fault, I mean, definitely you should have countries like Mali or Burkina Faso able to predict extreme weather events and then proactively I mean, acting to solve these challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very good observations. Thanks a lot. Um, I don't really think I have anything to add, add apart from one thing. Um, and that is, you, you, I think you're really touching on, on what is the main problem here. Um, you remember when Clinton was out in running for presidency, and we heard this, it's the economy stupid. Here is the financing uh, that is going to be really, really difficult. Who is going to pay the bill in the end? Um, and we have tried to, to look into that in the Paris Agreement, but, but there's a long way still to go and this is going to be extremely expensive. We all know that, and as you really also point out, some countries, basically the global north, has, they have already benefited from the emissions. Um, so there's an equity issue. Should they who have benefited then pay the ball for the party they've had, or is it the new? Common countries that also want to have, as you point out, energy emissions, uh, that's emissions due to energy production. Um, how, how do we handle that? Um, and and, and uh, I, yeah, yeah, that's going to be probably where things are going to, to honestly stumble. Um, right. Other comments? Questions? So I, I'm finding myself speaking a lot because my research is on failed and fragile states. So this, all three topics focus specifically on, on my uh, research that uh, addresses questions of vulnerability. And in, in response to your overarching question, I, I would say that a primary task is to, to stop drawing this distinction between a, uh, this set of problems that uh, the global south face and set of problems that the, the, the rest of the world face. It's a shared problem, the problem from hell, the wicked problem that requires immense coordination, political capital, resources, and so on. But one way to draw out the, the lack of distinction is in the area of migration. Now, you suggested that it's too early, perhaps, to uh, develop a, a regime recognizing uh, the rights of the individuals or groups that are uh, moving or displaced as a result of uh, climate change, but perhaps that's precisely where we should be going. I can't think of a better example than what's going on in, in Europe right now with respect to the refugee crisis. Maybe it's obvious, but what kind of attitudinal shifts are taking place within this part of the world that are both negative and positive? We've seen some negative 
shifts, in particular with uh, the decision by Britain to leave the European Union, which is partly in a function of its perceived uh, insecurity derived from the refugee crisis. In turn, that refugee crisis, if we take the evidence at face value, is partly driven by climate change. And it's only going to increase over time. So part of the challenge here is to encourage an attitudinal shift or an, at least the, a shift in perception that what affects those countries in the global south is ultimately going to affect us. There are others who have drawn out a more stark comparison here. I mean, ultimately, you can't escape climate change because it's going to come to you. Uh, you can live in the Antarctic, uh, but the rest of us have to live in regions where eventually people are going to be visiting you, uh, whether they're displaced or through some kind of uh, uh, well-structured immigration regime. They're going to come, and they're going to come as a result of uh, climate change. They're going to be displaced as a result of conflict. It might it's, it itself be driven by climate change. Uh, we can talk about the causal mechanisms there, but it's happening, it's happening now, whether it's urbanization in sub-Saharan Africa, people are leaving and they're coming to your doorstep. So how do you make that point without being sort of rude about it? It's very difficult. People need to accept the fact that they're, where they live is not going to be what, what they thought was, uh, you know, their, their country, their region, uh, as it existed 10, 15, 20 years ago. So opening borders perhaps is one solution, as uncomfortable as that might be for, for some countries. <laughs> now I come from a country, Canada, which is struggling with this issue. We've taken in 25,000 people from Iraq. It's not a lot. Uh, we think it's a big deal, but we could probably take in 200,000 before we even think about uh, you know, being burdened by, by that kind of shift in demography and so on. Thanks. Um, I know we need to, to be on time. Uh, just one comment, so I know there are two, at least here, who shown that they want to make comments. So, so just briefly, um, I think that the, the migration issue might be the one getting things on the, to the headlines and getting people, at least in Europe, Northern Europe, to react. We saw it last year, people walking literally on the roads towards the north. We had one million migrants coming over the Mediterranean last year. That has not happened this year. But do you know how many people actually, according to the UN, have arrived on the shores of the Mediterranean in Europe? Around half a million by August, early August. So we are not very different. It's not very different the number of people arriving. The difference is that they are not walking towards the north. They are, so to say, contained in the south. And that means that if you go to my country, Denmark, people think that, well, it's stabilized. It was just a 2015 issue, and they're not reacting anymore. So again, that's really uh, Giddens paradox that if you don't see it outside our windows, we don't think about it. And, and, and I, I think that migration might be the one, the tricking one, um, where people actually realize that things are happening. Right, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, just within the MUD framework you gave us, the MUD framework, migration, adaptation, Right. Where do we put in this issue now they are talking about everywhere? Green, is it green growth or something? Is it another MUD issue within that? Sorry, say again? The, the MUD framework you indicated. The MAD. MUD. Right, yes. Migration, adaptation, damages. Yes. And now we are, the talk around the policy table now is that they're changing either. Is it greening? How to responding to some of these issues? So where do you put into that framework? you give us the issue now is it green growth, green growth, green growth. I want to hear about your perceptions in terms of where we fit into that for us in the global south. Right. Um, green growth, to my mind, that is when you actually produce, especially energy, in ways which do, do not cause uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that would be mitigation to my mind. Um, and let's just face the, 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 the damage, the loss and damage idea, that is, is basically the situation where you cannot mitigate, you cannot adapt, you just have the problem and you cannot cope with the problem, then the idea is that then we need to, to find another way of compensating those harmed by this. That's the idea behind it. It's first of all uh, put forward by uh, the SIDS, small island uh, developing states, which are particularly vulnerable to this. So, 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 so that's a special uh, measure, you might say, that has been put into Article 8 of the Paris Agreement and 
when you try to read it, um, you wonder how lawyers could write like that. I, I find it difficult to read, at least. Um, and I find it very difficult to see what's really in it when it comes down to it. Um, but but the green production I would put into mitigation, first of all. Right. Right. So I think we have three minutes and one question. Is that right? <laughs> Yes, uh, my name is Ahti Tolovan, and when I was uh, uh, first uh, uh, studying international uh, affairs crises in Canada uh, 30 years ago, the big crisis was the population crisis, and now we have the climate crisis, and the more, more most recent is the refugee crisis in uh, developed areas of the world. So. Mm, it seems that the, that the population crisis has somehow gone away from these discussions. Now, um, I think we need to take another look at that because we've had a paper here on uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And you yourself pointed out that the climate uh, uh, impacts of climate change are, are most serious in the, in the uh, developing countries, uh, areas like uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which has also got an, an incredibly uh, rapid population increase. And, uh, and uh, this is also contributing to things like migration, not only the climate change, but the growth in the population, uh, as, as the first presenter uh, showed more and people are suffering just because there are more people there. And um, so uh, as a lawyer, perhaps the area that you can uh, look at is the area of sort of reproduction rights and rights of women in those areas. I looked at some, some statistics on that area and over half of people there don't have access to family planning. and. Uh, uh, don't have access to contraception and so on, and don't have information about it. Uh, so perhaps that's an area where we could assert a certain type of right to make this education and this choice available to people and um, in a way mitigate to their local, because I think it's a pipe dream to think that migration is going to solve these, that very, that there are, there are what, 40 million people in Syria and we get a million of them over there, over here. We're not going to solve this through migration. We have to look at, I don't think, Probably birth control and, and family planning is the solution in Syria, but in, in, in places where there are serious problems, we can see the coming crisis in climate change, and we see the growth of population there. We, see, we need to address, I think we need to find ways to address the population issue there too. Right, very short uh, answer. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think a very important point to make is that Climate change is a factor together with other factors. And, and you rightly point to population growth as one of these contributing factors to the challenge we've, we're faced with. Um, in, and, and, but we have to, 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 to acknowledge at the same time that population growth is very different in different areas of the world. You point to Sub-Saharan Africa. At the moment, we have a, uh, a thing that the population is estimated to be 970 million. According to the predictions by the UN, you'll see that by 2100, in 80, something like 84 years from now, it's expected to be around 4 billion. It's more than a quarter upling of the population size. At the same time, we are faced with more extreme weather events due to climate change. So we might, it, it's, it doesn't take too much fantasy to realize that this might actually work against one another and, and become diff difficult. Um, we're going to have probably a very large urbanization, and, and things are going to, to, to not work in the same direction. If you look out of, from, from a European Union perspective, as we do when we're here, you will also see that the Arab countries, they have less than 400 million inhabitants at the moment. Come to the same predictions, they'll have around 800 something million in 84 years from now. And at the same time, the climate change consequences, I expect to be much, much more severe in these countries. Um, to what extent that actually influences on the population growth, I don't know. But if you look at these two things together, you might imagine that this is going to be difficult. There are going to be more conflicts, people moving more around. They might also move, of course, to a to, to place where they can live, which I would do if I were in that situation, obviously. And that might mean, for instance, Northern Europe. So we're going to see very many other situations compared to what we have seen so far, which are going to be challenging. And I think that population growth is a very important one to, to take into account, absolutely. But that's just one of the factors we have to, to factor in, so to say. Right.
Okay, thank you. I think this concludes the session here. It's lunchtime, but let's thank the speakers first. One more.